Now, the rest of the story. Andrew was perhaps the wealthiest, most influential man in town. He was a textile manufacturer, an officer of all four local banks. He and his wife Abby lived in a large, handsome house. Their live-in housekeeper was Bridget Sullivan. Bridget Sullivan. Now, at 6.15, the morning of August 4, Bridget came downstairs from her attic bedroom. She was followed shortly by Andrew and Abby from their bedroom on the second floor. There was a pear tree in the yard. While breakfast was being prepared, Andrew picked a basket of pears. Seven o'clock now, Andrew and Abby were eating breakfast. Abby called to the housekeeper, who was still in the kitchen, "'Wash these windows today,' Bridget answered that she would, though it was the last thing on earth that she wanted to do. All through the past week, Bridget had been working very hard. Recent days had been the hottest of the year. It was evident even now before mid-morning that the day was to become even less comfortable. And still Bridget would do her best. After her own breakfast had been eaten and the dishes washed and put away, the housekeeper filled a water pail, went to wash the outside of the windows. But after only a little work, she became exhausted and ill. And it was the suffocating heat, she told herself. So she went back inside to look for Abby and found her in the guest bedroom. We have to imagine the words they exchanged. There is no record of the words, but evidently Bridget explained how hot it was and how sick she felt. Couldn't she please postpone washing the windows at least until the next day? And the answer was an emphatic no, and an argument ensued, and the climax of which was Bridget, the housekeeper, murdered Abby, murdered her. It was only afterward that Bridget realized that during the argument she'd heard the front door slam. Andrew, having overheard the angry words, had just then left the house. So Bridget waited for him to return. He must not have the opportunity to testify against her. He, too, must die. I'm going to pause right here. The reconstructed real-life scenario you've just relived was the product of years of research by author and criminologist Edward D. Radin. He has been called, quote, the soundest crime expert of our generation. And looking back, it all sounds so simple. But the double murder that we have been discussing, that most incredible crime of August 4, 1892, in Fall River, Massachusetts, was pinned on somebody else. Somebody nearby, although entirely unsuspecting. All of these years, the history books have condemned another person who was in fact tried and acquitted. Remember the old rhyme, Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother forty wax. When she knew what she had done, she gave her father forty-one. Historians and crime aficionados have been debating the case for more than a hundred years. But the most convincing analysis of all has echoed the jury's verdict. Lizzie Borden was innocent and has added this conclusion. It was Bridget Sullivan who wielded the hatchet. The maid did it, protesting that she didn't do windows. Now you know the rest of the story. And now the rest of the rest of the story. Behind me is the Borden House in Fall River, Massachusetts. It was inside this home between 10.45 and 11 o'clock on the morning of August 4th, 1892, when Abby Borden was murdered in her second floor bedroom, and her husband, Anthony Borden, was murdered as he was napping on a sofa in the first floor sitting room. The Borden case is one of the few tragedies that continually develop new phases of interest. The more we learn about it, the more remarkable it appears. That's how the Philadelphia Times described the case in 1892, and that description of the case is as relevant today as it was over 130 years ago. The case of Lizzie Borden has interested people along the same lines as London's Jack the Ripper. For more than 130 years, people have speculated as to who the murderer or murderers were. Did Lizzie Borden murder her father and stepmother? Why did people suspect her? Why would she have murdered them? What could have been the motive? 
could Bridget Sullivan have been the real axe murderer? The book Mr. Harvey spoke about was entitled Lizzie Borden, The Untold Story, published in 1961. Edward Radin's book was a commercial success. It made the New York Times bestseller list in 1961. Radin's claims were controversial. Some reviewers recommended it for sheer gripping entertainment, human understanding, and powerful reasoning. Scholars, some of whom had spent decades researching the case, derided the book as being wholly without merit. If you would like to get a copy of the book for yourself, I'll leave a link to it in the description. Anthony and Sarah Borden had three daughters, Emma, Alice, then Lizzie. Two-year-old Alice died in 1858. Lizzie's mother, Sarah, died five years later in 1863. Three years after Sarah's death, Anthony married Abby Durfee Gray. Now, on the morning of August 4, 1892, Abby and Anthony Borden were murdered with an axe, hatchet, or meat cleaver. Those facts cannot be disputed. Police figured the case would be solved quickly, but they were wrong. On Saturday, August 6th, two days after the double murder, Marshal Hilliard, State Detective George Seaver, Assistant Marshal Fleet, Captain Desmond of the Fall River Police, Medical Examiner Dolan, and Lawyer Andrew J. Jennings, who was the attorney for Anthony and Abby Borden when they were alive, met at the Borden residence to conduct a thorough search of the premises. They searched the house, as they say, from top to bottom. Now, this was literal. They began in the attic and worked their way down. The attic contained four rooms in an open area where the stairway extended. One of the scantily furnished rooms was occupied by the servant that Mr. Harvey told us about, Bridget Sullivan. Most of Bridget's possessions, some clothing items and a few mementos, were contained in a small trunk which they searched. They removed the mattress from her bed, shook it and pounded it in search of anything out of the ordinary, found nothing. They searched the nearby closet, found nothing out of place. The other three rooms in the attic were searched as thoroughly. After nearly an hour, the search party moved down to the second floor. They searched the bedroom in which Abby was murdered. They inspected the walls, the carpet, floors, closet, and the bed. They even cut open the mattress with a knife, but found only stuffing. They searched Lizzie's bedroom next. They inspected Lizzie's room as thoroughly as they had the previous rooms. They scrutinized every dress, skirt, wrapper, and underclothing that Lizzie possessed. On one skirt, they found a single blood stain. When they finished searching Lizzie's room, they searched Emma's room just as thoroughly, but found nothing of importance. They searched the ground floor, but found no more clues. In the cellar, they found an axe or hatchet with two blood stains. Of the dozen or so people investigators questioned, Lizzie was the only one who seemed evasive. Her answers often contradicted her earlier statements. At the time of the murders, Lizzie said she had gone to the barn to look for fishing tackle, although there was no evidence that a fishing trip was planned. Around the time of the murders and before anyone was notified of the murders, Lizzie burned a garment in the house. Bridget admitted that she was taking a nap in her bedroom in the attic when she heard Lizzie yell, Father is dead! Go for Dr. Bowen! Bridget was eliminated as a suspect in the murders because, contrary to Edward Radin's book, police could find no motive whatsoever. She was questioned numerous times by different investigators. They noted that she always spoke very highly of Mr. and Mrs. Borden. Investigators determined that Lizzie and Emma had the most to gain from the murders, but Emma had an alibi. She was in another town at the time of the murders, so she was eliminated as a suspect. Investigators concluded that Lizzie hated her stepmother and feared that she, the stepmother, would inherit her father's great wealth rather than Lizzie and Emma inheriting. For this reason, they said, Lizzie killed her, then killed her father to remove the possibility of detection. Police learned that on the day before the murders, Lizzie had attempted to buy poison known as hydrocyanic acid at a local drugstore. The clerk at the pharmacy knew this to be a strong poison and asked what she would use it for. 
Lizzie's answer must not have convinced the clerk because she left without the poison. She made a similar attempt at another local pharmacy with the same result. On Wednesday evening that very day, August the 3rd, the day before the double murder, Anthony, Abby, Lizzie, and Bridget ate dinner together. Following dinner, Anthony, Abby, and Lizzie were taken sick and vomited. All of them drank milk with their meal, except for Bridget. Just before going to bed that night, though, Bridget drank a glass of the milk. She awoke with a severe headache, which was rare for Bridget. She drank more milk that morning and, like the Bordens the night before, got violently ill and vomited freely. But the judge would not allow the two pharmaceutical clerks to testify at Lizzie's trial. On the Thursday following the double murder, August the 11th, 1892, police arrested Lizzie and charged her with the murders. While Lizzie was in jail waiting trial, newspapers noticed that Thursday had become Lizzie's unlucky day. Thursday, August the 4th, was the day that Andrew Borden and Abby Borden were murdered. The newspapers added that it was a day that must live as one of horror in the mind of the daughter, whether she be innocent of the crime or not. Thursday, August the 11th, one week after the crime, Lizzie was arrested and charged with the murders. Thursday, September the 1st, four weeks after the murders, Lizzie's preliminary hearing ended. Lizzie was adjudged probably guilty. Thursday, December the 1st, 17 weeks after the murder, the grand jury indicted Lizzie for the murders. On July 21st, 1893, a large crowd gathered for the closing day of Lizzie's trial. The district attorney continued his argument from the day before and attempted to convince the jury that Lizzie, after murdering her stepmother, found it necessary to kill her father in order to remove all evidence of the crime. The district attorney discussed the dresses hatchets, and other articles of evidence. Then Lizzie Borden was given an opportunity to speak. Hesitatingly and with a voice faltering, though clear, she said, I am innocent, but I will leave my case in your hands and with my counsel. The jury retired, but returned only a short time later. As Lizzie stood in the courtroom awaiting her fate, the jury foreman was asked to return the verdict and he said, not guilty. Newspapers reported that upon hearing the verdict, a cheer went up which might have been heard half a mile away, and there was no attempt to check it. People rose from their seats, waved their hats, and cheered. Now Lizzie, who had not shed a single tear through the whole of the grueling trial, laid her head down on the rail in front of her and cried. During her trial, Lizzie carried a white handkerchief, a smelling bottle, and a black fan. She was usually the best-dressed woman in the room. Lizzie had an expression on her face, even at the announcement of her acquittal, one of the saddest that can be imagined. That's what the newspaper said. Now, who do you think murdered Anthony and Abby Borden? Was the double murder committed by Lizzie? Bridget? Maybe someone else? Lizzie Borden died on June the 1st, 1927. Her older sister, Emma, died just nine days later. For the remainder of their lives, Lizzie and Emma refused to discuss the case. Lizzie, Emma, Alice, their mother, Sarah, and murdered victims, Anthony and Abby, were all buried at the Borden plot in Oak Grove Cemetery in Fall River, Massachusetts. In June of 1893, an article in the Anderson Weekly Democrat said, the Lizzie Borden murder case will go down into history as one of the most celebrated in the annals of crime. Her acquittal was a foregone conclusion as the chain of circumstantial evidence did not hold together. The mystery of the murder of the Bordens will probably never be solved. And so it remains and probably will remain technically unsolved. I'm Brad Dyson. Thanks for watching, and as Paul Harvey would say, good day.